Hello, welcome to uh, the second video for chapter three of Basic Sentential Logic, Informal Fallacies and Cognitive Biases. Uh, this video, the uh, second video, uh, is going to explain why the proof method works. So what we did in the first video is I gave you a basic introduction. We learned the first two uh, rules, or at least two rules, modus ponens, disjunctive syllogism. Now we're going to, I'm going to explain why does this work? Why is it that the proof method actually works. The key is this. The rules, all of the rules that we have in chapter 3 as well as chapter 4, are truth-preserving. What does truth-preserving mean? It means if, remember the rules, um, the inference rules from chapter 3 that we have so far, and the rest of them will work like this as well, all of the inference rules. There are certain lines that they need. So modus ponens, you need a conditional and the antecedent. For disjunctive syllogism, you need a disjunction, the negation of one of the disjuncts. Um, and then if you have those pieces, you can write a new line. Well, what truth-preserving means is that if the pieces that you apply the rule to, right, for modus ponens, the conditional and the antecedent, if those things are true, then the new line that you produce will be true. So it preserves truth. Okay. Um, now for the inference rules, there's no guarantee as to what happens if the lines you're applying the rule to aren't all true. Okay, it doesn't matter for the inference rules. And we'll, I'll explain why later. The key thing though, is that if it's applied to things that are all true, the rule will only produce things that are true. So if the things that you're applying the rule to are all true, what, it, what you produce will definitely be true. That's guaranteed. Here I've got three, like there was three lines. In fact, um, the inference rules will either apply to one, two, or three lines. There's, there's one in the optional material that applies to three. In the regular material, it's either one or two. But however many it is, if all of those lines are true, the rule will produce, uh, the line produced by the rule will definitely be true. If they're false, it, we don't know. There's no guarantee. It's not that um, we know what will happen. Or if there's a mixture of true and false, we don't know if the new line will be true or false, right? The guarantee, the crucial thing, is that if they're all true, we're guaranteed that the new line we produce will be true. So what does this mean? So suppose I'm doing this proof here. Here's the premises, here's the conclusion, and these are my derived lines. I haven't introduced all of these rules yet, but don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. Well, the fact that they're truth-preserving means this. It means that if these are true, the premises, right, that I started with before I derived any new lines, if these are true, then line three, which I derived using a rule from the lines above it, if these are true, this has to be true, because the rules are truth-preserving. Okay? That means if 1 and 2 are true, 3 has to be true. So if 1 through 3 are true, then 4 is going to be true, because I derive 4 from these using a truth-preserving rule. So if 1 and 2 are true, then all, all 4 of these are true. If all 4 of these are true, then 5 has to be true. I got five, again, from a truth-preserving rule that I used on stuff that was true. All the way down to six. Okay, so if these are all true, six has to be true. So if the premises are all true, the premises are one and two are true, then every derived line has to be true. Okay, and the conclusion is one of the derived lines. That's the last derived line. Okay, so if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And remember, that's the definition of validity. So that's why the proof method works. These rules aren't just random rules that let you say, okay, if you have something that looks like this, you know, a statement in this form, you can derive a statement in this form. Those weren't just pulled out of thin air. They're very specific rules that they have to satisfy a requirement. They have to be truth-preserving. And that's what lets them work. Here's another way to, to think about it. Here's a proof. 
this one does use modus ponens and disjunctive syllogism. These are the two rules that um, I introduced last time. And in fact, we did this proof. Uh, this was, the, I think, the last one uh, in the last video that we did. Um, think, of, think of the truth-preserving rules this way. I'm going to get rid of the derived lines right now and just look at the, um, the premises. Okay, these are the premises. If we did a truth table for this, for these premises, it would look like this, okay? Premise one, premise two, premise three, okay? Now, where are the rows where these are all true? Turns out there's only one row where the premises are all true. So this is the situation where all of the premises are true. What the truth-preserving rule rules mean, and now I'm just get, showing you how you can think of this in terms of truth tables, is here's the first line I derived. I got B by 1, 3 modus ponens. The fact that the rule is truth preserving means that if I added this to my truth table, B, it would be the case that the rows where the premises are all true, my new derived line would also be true on those rows. So I would just extend this truth through here. Okay, and then the next derived line, not C, if I put that on the truth table, this would also be true on all of the rows where these were true. What that means is that any row where the premises are all true, in this case there is only one, will also be a row where every derived line is true, okay? Because that's just the way the rules work. The rules guarantee that any row where the premises are true, your derived line is also going to be true on those rows, okay? The conclusion is also a derived line, which means that um, there won't be a counterexample row, okay? Because any row where the premises are true, the conclusion is true, a counterexample row would have to be a row where these are true, but that's false. We know there can't be one if, if uh, the rules are truth-preserving. So to summarize, because the rules are truth-preserving, any row where the premises are all true will be a row where the uh, lines derived from them will be true, including the conclusion, because you derived the conclusion, which means there can't be a counterexample row, so the argument has to be valid. Now, I demonstrated this on the truth table with a particular argument, but now I just want to show just in general how this would work, right? So suppose I have um, an argument, premises P1, P2, P3. It doesn't matter what the premises are. And this is my truth table. And if I did a truth table for this, it might turn out that all of my premises are true on these rows, let's say. Those are all of the rows where the premises are all true. What about these other rows? Well, it doesn't matter. The only thing I know is that the premises aren't all true. Maybe on some of these they're all false, maybe some of them there's a mixture of trues and falses, um, but these are the rows where they're all true. Well, then these deltas, these are the, my derived lines, okay? Well, because the rules are truth-preserving, when I add my next derived line on the truth table, the fact that they're truth-preserving guarantees that this will also be true on every row where all my premises were true. So I'm just extending this um, kind of shaded area of truth out. And that's going to keep occurring for every new line I derive. What will the truth value be on these other rows? We don't know. It doesn't matter. Because what the rules produce when they're applied to things that are either false or a mixture of true and false the rules make no guarantee. Maybe, they'll, maybe these will be true here, maybe they'll be false. It doesn't matter. The crucial thing is that where these are all true, these will definitely be true. And that's going to continue until we get to the last derived line, which is the conclusion. So if you can derive the conclusion, it will also be true on any row where the premises are all true, which means there can't be a counterexample row. Okay. 
Now, you might think, oh, hey, Rick, there's one other possibility. Remember from chapter two, what happens if the premises are inconsistent, right? If the premises were inconsistent, then there wouldn't be any row here where they're all true. We wouldn't have any grayed out row. You might say, hey, what does the proof method do then? Well, the proof method still works, and here's why. Okay, so the other possibility that we're thinking of right now is that the premises aren't consistent. So you can think of what I just described as what happens if the premises are consistent, if there's at least one row where the premises are all true, then every new derived line, including the conclusion, will be true on all of those rows. So the argument satisfies the definition of validity. What if, there, what if the premises aren't consistent? Well, proof method still works. Why? Because if the premises aren't consistent, the argument's also going to be valid because there's no counterexample row. Okay, so if you can derive the conclusion from the premises, and it turns out the premises aren't consistent, the argument's valid anyway. It's valid just because the premises are inconsistent. So there's two possibilities here. Either the premises are consistent or they're not. If they are consistent, and you derive the conclusion, you know it's valid because there won't be a counterexample row because in all rows where the premises are all true, the conclusion is true. The other possibility is the premises aren't consistent, in which case there's also not gonna be a counterexample row because there's no rows where the premises are all true. Either way, the argument's valid. So to summarize, if you can derive the conclusion from the premises using the truth-preserving rules, then you know that that argument is valid whether the premises are in fact consistent or not. Either way, you know the argument's valid. Okay, that's it for this video. Uh, in the next couple videos, I'm gonna be introducing uh, more uh, rules and also um, fine tuning the, uh, the, the proof method a little bit, just being very clear on some things you shouldn't do and some things that you can do.